When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that would like to remind us all that the world is made for people who aren't cursed with self-awareness. He is the captain. Yeah, my new self-help book's coming out. Stop beating yourself and start stroking your ego. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Propeller Brewing Company's London Style Porter. The Porter style was created in the mid-1750s. It's a dark, full-flavored beer, but much smoother and less bitter than a stout. Porter was the beer of the masses long before lagers. ABV, 5%. Garage grade, 3 and 3 quarter bottle caps out of 5. And this week we are drinking cold beers thanks to a bunch of our good friends right here. First up... All the way in Dublin, Ireland, we have Edane. And a big cheers, mates, to Kelly in Hobart, Indiana. Next up, we have Ashley in Hiram, Utah. Ashley loves the captain. And a big shout to Lauren in Naples, Florida. Next, we have Chris W. working mommy duty in Evergreen, Colorado. Next up, we have Taylor in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And last but certainly not least, we have Brian Wong holding it down in parts unknown. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and donated to this week's beer fund. And for that, we send you a big thank you. And a quick reminder to Brian Wong, pay your water bill, you filthy animal. And make sure you follow our show on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff at True Crime Garage. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Accused killer Sidney Tearhuse did lawyer up, and he got a good one, or at least an experienced one. His lawyer was a man who faced more criminal murder defense cases I believe, in the history of Canada. He had argued at the time nearly 700 murder cases. So if anyone could get Tearhuse a light sentence, this is going to be the guy for the job. Tearhuse did agree to talk with Dan Zupanski, and why wouldn't he have? This guy seems to want to tell his story and to tell the story of the murder itself. Yeah, but this is going to make his lawyer's job a little more difficult. (laughs) That it is. Dan thought the case was a good one to spotlight for his work with the Peoples for Justice, but this case was already making headlines, and Dan believed there was a bigger story here, and this could be a book. So Dan and Tearhuse work out a deal that the two of them would write this book together about the case, and they would split the proceeds 70-30. The things, as you just said here, Captain regarding making Tearhuse's case more difficult to argue in court. Yeah. 100%. 
that is so spot on because the things that he's telling Dan Zupanski, one in person and two through letters, he's talking about how not only did he kill and mutilate this poor man, he seemed to, or at least from his writings, he seemed to enjoy it. Right. He seemed to enjoy it very much. He sent Dan several letters Mm -hmm. and even diagrams of drawings of how he dissected the body and things that he right, was yeah, intending on. to do. If we're going to hold on, if we're going to talk about dissecting, there we go. Continue on my kind sir. So the other thing too, that we have not got to yet. And you look, you had a statement Wait, yesterday. I, you got to clear something up for me because you said Dan was going to split the profits Correct. Now, that's legal there? It is and it isn't. We'll get into that in in, in more detail here in a minute. Just just, I'll remind you later. I want to circle back to something that you said on yesterday's show and maybe a bit of a head scratcher for some of the people out there. You talked about the length of time and we talked about the amount of skill that would be involved, the amount of labor involved to mutilate this body in the manner that it was. You made a statement saying this proves, this points to premeditated murder. And people were probably going, well, all of that, all of those acts were carried out post-mortem. How does that point to premeditated murder? What it points to is that our offender, that our killer, very likely has a fascination with the dead, has a fascination with playing and doing with things to a corpse, and you can't have a corpse until you murder someone. So it very much plays into the thought of, was this a premeditated murder or not? I agree. When we talked about letters that he sent and about diagrams that he sent to Dan, talking about things he wanted to do or things that he did do with the body, there were also acts of necrophilia. Oh, okay. Tierhuis talked about playing with the body and playing with body parts. He talked about partially dissecting one of the hands and one of the forearms. Tierhuis even talked about the power that he felt when he's holding the parts of the body and how it made him know that he had done the right thing, meaning that the murder was the right thing for him to do. Right. As we said, according to Tierhuis, 6.20 p.m. is when he says Robin Green died. I mean, it's pretty sick. I mean, he's he's playing flicky flicky with the, with the dead. Tierhuis says he has serial killers for role models. This is what he tells Dan. And he actually notes four killers in particular. And this is Dennis Nielsen, who he says is his hero, Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, and Eileen Warnos. For those not familiar, Eileen Warnos was an American serial killer who murdered seven men in Florida between the years of 1989 and 1990. She shot these men at point-blank range. Aileen claimed this was in self-defense and that the men had raped her or attempted to do so. Aileen was a sex worker. She was convicted and executed by the state of Florida. This is somebody that we will at some point want to do a profile on. Episode 811. Okay. John Wayne Gacy, who we covered in episodes, well, this was way back then, Episodes 105 and 106. And for those that listen to those two episodes, you will remember Gacy raped, tortured, and murdered at least 33 teenage boys and young men between the years of 1972 and 1978. Gacy received a much easier death than any of his victims when he was killed via lethal injection at the Stateville Correctional Center on May 10th, 1994. His death was confirmed in the middle of the night. And actually, this is, this is a strange thing. This is something I will never forget. I remember hearing back in 1994, I had a paper route. Mm-hmm. And I remember hearing on the news early that morning before anyone else in my family had got up for the day, hearing the news that Gacy had been executed. Jeffrey Dahmer, who of course is very well known in the true crime community, also known as the Milwaukee cannibal or the Milwaukee monster. He committed rape, murder, and dismemberment of 17 men and boys 
from 78 to 1991. He ultimately received the old prison justice and was killed by an inmate on November 28, 1994. These are Tier Hughes' role models. Those are his Heroes. words. Yeah, well, he says hero for one, yeah. And with, with the Dahmer case, uh, you were saying that earlier before the murder actually took place in r- room 309 that they were taking pictures. Is this a old-fashioned camera or is it a Polaroid? Do, do no, you... it was a disposable camera. Oh, okay. So did they get any evidence off that other than that they could place him in the room and place them together? Nothing other than that because the pictures themselves, from my understanding, only depict both of them being alive and well before any type of attack occurred. Right, but I also wonder if he got this from Dahmer because Dahmer would take pictures. Uh, at the time, I think Dahmer was using a Polaroid, but he would take pictures of a lot of his victims or he'd even get them to come back to his apartment saying, hey, come back, I'll take some pictures of you. It's it's possible. It seems like a weird thing to do and then turn yourself in. Yeah. There there doesn't seem to be yeah, but that, to me, good very- reason or to be well thought out that I'm going to take pictures to capture this moment yet i'm not going to view these pictures okay there's one crime that is similar with Dahmer, where he picks up a man takes him back to a hotel and blacks out woke up the guy was i believe beat to death so that's similar to to Dahmer. i i wonder if he read about some of these guys fantasies because like you said the mutilation of the body would be proof of premeditation if he read about some of these guys fantasies and identified with them well that's why i'm giving a very brief look at each of these individuals that he named as his so-called role models yeah and it, look these are people that tear Hughes likely studied and the last one that we need to go through is dennis nielsen this is the one who he said was his hero Now, Nielsen was a Scottish serial killer who was convicted of killing six people, but murdered at least 12. It's suspected that he murdered 12 young men between the years of 1978 and 1983. He committed these murders at his home. This was at two different addresses in North London. He strangled most of these young men. He would then keep the bodies for an extended period of time he would eventually dissect the bodies and dispose of the remains by burning them or flushing them down the toilet. Tyrkus claims in court that the letters that he sent to Dan Zupanski that's giving great detail right. on how he committed the murder and things that he did with the body and how he enjoyed it, he claims in court that these details, he found all this information in books that he found in the the prison library at the jailhouse library. And he took details from these different crimes of some of the killers that we previously mentioned and pieced together this fictional story of what he tells Dan happened, that it's not, you can't use those letters to determine that I actually knew what I was doing, that it was in fact premeditated murder and that I am a very, very sick and disturbed individual. You can't use that because it was all some fiction that I came up with in my mind, put pen to paper and sent it off to Dan Zupanski to try to tell or to assist him in telling a good story. Right. All of these killers uh, that we mentioned too is interesting that he list these killers in my opinion. And uh, because they're all big names, uh, these killers received a good deal of notoriety for the murders and for the gruesomeness of the murders that they committed. Dan would learn quite a bit about Tear Hughes. Unfortunately, most of what is known about Tear Hughes comes from Sidney Tear Hughes himself. He has decided what would be learned about him, what he would tell people. Tear Hughes spent most of his adult life working as a chef. He moved around quite a bit too. Remember, we said he was from Winnipeg, but moved away. He actually lived in Vancouver, amongst other places, for some time. Tear Hughes moved back to Winnipeg or was in the process of doing so at the time of Robin Green's murder. 
He was moving back because he had recently lost his job as a chef, and he was let go or fired and was waiting to get back on his feet or in the process of doing so in Winnipeg. Yeah. This Royal Albert Hotel, it was the kind of place where you could throw down a little money and stay for an extended period of time. So I don't know for sure, but unlike our victim, Robin Green, who was simply in town to visit family and party for the holiday, Tierhuis was probably there for an extended stay as he attempted to move back to that area. Before all of this, Tierhuis didn't have much of a police record. Maybe not as big of or as lengthy of one as most would think. He did have a conviction for exposing himself to a newspaper boy. Yeah, and here you're just trying to deliver the papers, then, ugh, goo. Tierhuis was adopted. He was an indigenous person adopted by a white family who lived in Winnipeg. Tierhuis would claim abuse, but of course there were never any charges to back any of this up. He he claims to have been physically and sexually abused by some of his family members. I know some of the details of that. I don't care to go into it because I don't believe that these statements are true. These are, in my opinion, highly suspect claims, unsubstantiated claims of abuse. And I actually liken these claims to be similar to those of Arthur Shawcross, who, after his eventual capture, just seemed to lie about everything, including abuse by members of his family. Right. So it is through this book project that Dan Zupanski acquires all of this information from Sidney Tierhuis about the murder. Dan decides this stuff is evidence. Most of what Dan has, of course, is from Tierhuis. Tierhuis wrote about it himself and sent it to Zupanski. This is evidence about the murder, about intent of murder, and truly a glimpse into the mind of the killer. Right, and we know that he told the police, which I, I'm not sure how that works there, but when they see him and the, and he takes them to the scene of the crime, he said they ask how it happened. He said, well, I did it, and I chopped him up with this knife. So to me, that would be oral confession and then it seems like Zupanski's going hey this is a written confession all right something you wanted to get back to we need to talk about the deal the deal between Dan and Tier Hughes to split the proceeds of this book 70 30 yeah the way that this goes down and I will really simplify this and make it very vanilla because we don't need to go through every little tiny bit of this but generally speaking what we have here is Dan Zupanski is aware of current laws in place and aware of laws that are in the process of possibly being enacted. Right. There was to be a law put into place. It hadn't passed yet, but it was to be put in place so that criminals could not profit from their crimes much like our son of Sam laws that we have, which technically eventually those were ruled to be unconstitutional, but there are still similar laws in place here in the United States that hold up the general concept of that idea that perpetrators cannot profit from his or her crimes. Right. So Dan knows that this is in the process of being voted upon and that he's aware that it's going to pass. This is not when, when you go and you put this bill, I don't even know if they call them bills up there. I love when we talk other countries, <laughs> we know so much. It's tough enough to figure out America. Yeah. So well rounded we are when this bill is put up or this, this act is put into place mm -hmm. or to be voted upon. Dan is aware that this is the type of situation that passes. It's not something that, sits around and waits and there it never passes. This is a law that everybody can easily get behind. Nobody out walking around in society, no normal person wants a murderer to profit from their murder. Right. They just don't. He goes in there with this idea, knowing that Tierhuis thinks he has leverage because Tierhuis is the man holding the story. He's the one holding all the information. If he doesn't give that to Dan Zupanski, he can give it to somebody else. 
So Dan wants to make it look like, hey, we're working on this thing together. We're going to split the proceeds. He's also aware that this law is going to pass eventually, and I can flip the table, flip the script on tier use. He's not going to get paid or profit in any way from the information that he's provided. Dan's also very confident that tier Hughes will provide him with information because he seems eager to talk to someone. Do you think, uh, Dan Zupanski would look him in the eye and say, ha, got him a hundred percent stories all mine. Creepo. Maybe now I don't know at the time because there are some complications with that. So Dan Zupanski through his correspondence with murderer, Sidney tier goes from, journalist and author to star witness in this whole mess because his correspondence in the work and effort that Dan put in, he provides the prosecution with a detailed and graphic minute by minute timeline of the crimes and the murder. And then the postmortem behavior of the offender offender. Right. Also because tear Hughes is dumb enough to believe that he's communicating with a quote unquote friend He also provides his feelings and thoughts and puts pen to paper and writes them down to later be viewed when trying to determine his punishment for a very brutal and cold blooded murder. Right. Which his lawyer is probably trying to argue. The defense lawyer is probably trying to argue that my client's insane and, and, and therefore, and he didn't plan this. So therefore it should be manslaughter or even less. Yeah, second degree murder charges back then would you would be facing if convicted a 10 to 25 year sentence. All right, keep that in mind as we go through the rest of this. Within those details are also Tier Hughes writing what he's thinking and feeling as he is dismembering this innocent man. And again, he talks about the power he felt during the act and how severed pieces of this body how it turned him on. Right. He felt powerful. Tear Hughes also believes two far-fetched ideologies that the savagery of this murder is going to bring him notoriety and money by committing the horrible act itself. And then telling this putrid tale with fanciful descriptions from his writings. Tear Hughes was even telling Dan what to name the book or at least providing several suggestions for the title. Yeah, what were those? I couldn't find that list, and I've seen that list somewhere in the past. We should have reached out to Dan. Maybe Dan can tweet us or something. If I've he, seen if that list, list before, and I could not find it anywhere within this past week or so. But Dan, if you're listening, tweet us. The that book list. itself is called trophy kill and that is one of the suggestions provided to dan from tear hughes and dan had to testify against tear hughes this is scary stuff this is scary for many reasons we know what tear hughes is capable of right we know what he has done that is not in dispute at this trial what is in dispute is was this premeditated and did he of his own power and of his own control, commit this horrible act and murder. We talked about the two-for-one deal. This this is why this makes this super scary, right? Dan Zupanski has to testify against this guy, against the guy that he fooled, that he tricked. Right. The two-for-one deal states that while you're in jail, waiting for your court date, you get two-for-one time served because of the... It's more harsh or it's considered to be more harsh by Canadian law while you're waiting for your trial rather than serving your time in prison. So we're going to give you double time for it. Remember, we said if this thing goes to second degree murder, the penalty is 10 to 25 years. Tear Hughes managed to, if he was managed to get it reduced to second degree murder or manslaughter, which many of these cases do go that route. Right, right. He's going to get a lighter, shorter sentence. And then, right, and plus he gets double time for the time served. Right, meaning if Sidney Tearhuse gets 12, 15 years, something like that, he's already served 10 years of that. Okay, let me get into that real quick. The trial took five years to get to. Wow. He sat cool. in jail waiting for a court date 
for five years. That's, that's too because, long. Well, that's, that's of his long. own doing. Right, right, right. He's manipulating the system. Him and, and his lawyer claim that th- he's not getting a proper jury trial, that he should get a jury of his peers, and because he's an indigenous person, that they should be... Basically, he, he wants the peers to be exactly like him. Make up a jury of people exactly like me. A and that's shit stains. That's not how it yeah. works. Uh, we need a whole jury of shit stains, Your Honor. But think about this. If he only gets 10 years, we could be talking about parole hearings as soon as this dude is convicted. Right. Zapansky could be a marked man. Yeah. Tear Hughes, fortunately. His next trophy. Yeah. Does not. This doesn't work out in his favor or to the extent that his lawyer was trying to manipulate the system. He does get convicted of murder. He does receive that life sentence with possible parole at 25 years. This show is sponsored by better help. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. At Consumer Cellular, you get the same exact coverage as the largest carriers, but for up to half the cost. Same thing, up to half the cost. Up to half the cost for the same thing. 50% the money for 100% the same thing. I hope I'm making myself clear. Consumer Cellular. When freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Half the cost savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single-line 5 gigabyte data plan with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single-line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plan offered by T-Mobile and Verizon May 2023. All right. Cheers, mates. Thanks for joining us in the garage. Cheers, Captain. Some things that I wanted to get into before we wrap up today. Some what I believe to be very important questions here that come to mind when reviewing this case and questions that I think need to be discussed. For one, do you or do the people out there believe that Tearhus actually killed for fame and notoriety? I could see somebody saying yes because there's some evidence of that. I'm going to say no because I think that's after the fact. I think this was more about the thrill and the power that he would seek afterwards Mm -hmm. and and possibly these fantasies that he had that he wanted to carry out because it was so horrendous that I think it was like a byproduct. Like He thought, well, now that this has happened and now – that I possibly could spend my whole life in in prison. How can I profit off this or how can I make something of myself? Yeah. I don't know that he killed for fame or notoriety. I'm, I'm kind of with you on that a little bit in the sense that maybe he figured there's no way of getting out of this. And we've already stated, he says serial killers were his role models Maybe he saw some of the fame and notoriety that they received from their crimes and thought, well, if I'm going to have to do the time, at least maybe I make myself a somewhat of a name. Right. Now, if in fact he did, I'm not going to, 
I don't know that I would go as far to say that he didn't. I, I really feel on the fence regarding that question. And that is a big question that comes up in this case. But if Tier Hughes did, in fact, kill for fame and notoriety, look, we already know he would not have been the only person to ever do so. I'm, Luca Magnata yeah. killed and dismembered Lynn June, and there's no doubt that he did that for what he presumed to be fame. He He did receive international notoriety, not so much for the murder, but because he packaged and mailed off the hands and feet of the victim to elementary schools and to political party headquarters. And because of the video he released on the internet depicting the murder scene. I'm sure there are probably plenty more, but Luca, of course, is is the one that first comes to mind. Also, though, I think there's also evidence against that he did it for fame because if he's telling these people later that, hey, these were my heroes, these serial killers, well, as far as we know, this is his only kill. And so I think if it was like, oh, well, if I kill somebody and I do it in such a horrific manner, I can keep killing and I'll have to keep killing and keep doing so in a horrific manner, just like my quote unquote heroes. Right. But I think the thing when we talk about somebody like Luca Magnata is he set it up in a way that he would be able to kill one person and receive that same notoriety, be, be lumped in with some of the worst of the worst, but having only killed one. Right. But you bring up uh, my other question which is an interesting one to ponder is tear Hughes possibly a serial killer. What, what do you think the chances are that he has killed before this? I mean, this is pretty gruesome stuff here, even by serial killer standards. So making it somewhat difficult to believe that this is tear Hughes's first go at homicide. Yeah. I think because of his small criminal history, one can say, well, this is possibly the first one, and, and he also confessed to it pretty quickly. It's almost like once he came to or claims to come to is when he goes, oh, I must have did this, and I need to tell somebody. And But it's so horrific. That's the evidence that you go, well, this person has the ability to have done this before. Yeah, and it appears that he has the fascination to have done this before. Yeah. That this is some kind of fantasy that he eventually lived out, or maybe it's one that he has, in fact, lived out in a different manner once or twice or three times before. The thing is, with this case, you're not going to find another one that is identical to this postmortem behavior by the offender. Right. But the confession that you reference is really, truly the first thing that makes, I believe, would make one say, no, he's not done this before because he, in fact, did turn himself in. But. Well, it seemed like he couldn't stop confessing. Somewhat. I mean, here's the thing. Mm. The confession, I think when we see behaviors of other individuals, maybe we take that away and say, okay, that is not a 100% indicator that he has not, in fact, killed before. Because we have seen scenarios, some like that of Ed Kemper. I mean, he killed and killed and killed, and oddly enough, he dismembered corpses too, but then one day he turned himself in. Right. Then you have someone like Wayne Adam Ford, dubbed the remorseful serial killer, also out in California, just like Kemper. Ford killed four women and then one day just walks into a police station with a severed breast in his pocket for effective proof, mind you, and confesses to being a serial killer. Now, some believe that this man may have killed more, but only telling the police about the ones that he wanted to, leaving out some of the kills and confessing to others, and all of this for one reason or another. And unfortunately, Ford, if in fact he did kill more than four, only he would know the reasons why he would confess to some but not others. Yeah. Usually, Captain, what I have always looked for in this 
type of scenario when we talk about confessed killers uh-huh. and why they would confess to some but not others is the obvious. And in our great country, some states have a possible penalty of death right. for one's crimes, and others do not. That making sense why someone might confess to a murder in one state, but choose to leave out a murder that they've done in another state. And we've also talked about shame. And of course, it's hard to believe that someone capable of murdering multiple individuals would have any form of shame, but it seems that they do. We know this from someone like Ted Bundy, who was a partially confessor of his crimes. Right. In his confessions, he hinted at and made reference to acts of necrophilia, but never outright admitted to it. And we know that on February 9th, 1978, Ted abducted and killed 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, but that wasn't a crime he was willing to confess to. Right, but I think it goes back to what you were saying before, is while well, the, the selfish reason of, well, I'm not going to admit to killing somebody in this state because I'd get the death penalty. But I also think they omit, they omit any killings of children because they know that could mean the death penalty for them in jail. Because we, we have seen uh, time and time again that the people that have committed crimes against children, they, they get punished. Well, and the situation with Sidney Tierhus is just this. He was hoping that because he claims to be all drugged up and intoxicated, that he's going to get a second degree murder charge or a manslaughter charge. And this will not, this doesn't mean he's spending life in prison or that he's spending 25 years in prison. So if I walk into a, what I believe to be police department and tell them I woke up and found some guy chopped up in my hotel room, I must have killed him. Right. That plays to me, hopefully getting second degree murder charges or manslaughter charges. Now, if I say within that same sit down meeting. Oh, by the way, I also did this in Vancouver and I also did this in Edmonton. I did it in, uh, you know, any other place. Right. But by the way, I blacked out in all those cases. It's going to make it seem like now we're talking about a premeditated murder hands down. Right. And that his defense is not that he didn't kill this man. His defense is that he was not of his own control, thus light severely lessening the sentence that he would receive. And by the way, maybe I'm going to receive a little bit of notoriety, a little bit of fame and a little bit of money along the way while I sit here and, and wait to be released back to the public. Yeah. It's really a tricky thing. The thing with tear Hughes too, I'm, I would be curious to know more about why and when he chose to pack everything up and move to a different city. I'm curious what is the actual reasons and the why and the how of him moving back to Winnipeg and him moving from Vancouver. If you're a chef Mm -hmm. in Canada, Vancouver, from my understanding or Toronto is where you want to be. He was in Vancouver at one time. That's the place he's going to make the most money. That's going to be the most opportunity and the most jobs for somebody of that profession. Right. Is there an unsolved crime that he possibly would fit the bill for? Yeah. Did it get too hot in the kitchen and he decided to run? Too hot in the hot tub. Dan Zupanski was a volunteer journalist, a wannabe true crime author. This story picked him, and I'm glad that it did. Dan Zupanski received a lot of extremely unwarranted criticism for his efforts to get to the truth and to present the truth to the public. The public that would be just as afraid as Dan was if they just took the time to educate and understand the true gravity of this situation and the dangers that someone like Tear Hughes presents to any society that chooses to allow him to live in that society. I said volunteer journalist and I said wannabe true crime author and I said that with extreme respect to Dan. Dan didn't go to school to be a journalist. And later when his book title trophy kill came out, he was then criticized by people in that profession saying Dan is not a true journalist. A journalist 
is someone who collects, writes, and shares information with the public. Dan is every bit of a real and true journalist, and one very big, giant step above those that critiqued him, and above and better than those who just push fluff pieces for a paycheck. Right. Dan is a journalist with integrity, a man that cares about the truth and that worked his butt off on this tear Hughes Robin Green case, getting the story straight from the mouth of the monster and then provided that truth to the public. He truly performed a real act of public service here. So I just don't understand the, the criticism. I want to thank everybody for sharing the episodes on social media. For our old episodes, check out the Stitcher app. They're free on the Stitcher app. And we also have a weekly bonus show on Stitcher Premium called Off the Record. Nick, do we have a recommended reading for this week? Of course we do. If you go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the recommended page, you will see a lot of recommendations from two guys in a garage listed right there for you. This week, we are recommending, of course, Trophy Kill, The Shall We Dance Murder, The Trial and Revelations of a Psychopathic Killer by our good friend, longtime friend of the show, Dan Zupanski. Check that out on our website. Yeah, Dan Zupanski, the king of true crime. Until next week. Everybody be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.